use that phrase this morning as a springboard into my message to you from Matthew 5 verses 14, 15, and 16. Now, this fifth chapter of the book of Matthew, we have what we've come to know as the Beatitudes, or stuff that uh, we're to do and be blessed because we do it. We're to be poor in spirit. We are to mourn, comfort people. We are to be meek. We are to be hungry and thirsty for righteousness. We need, we need to show mercy. We need to be pure in heart before the Lord. We need to be peacemakers. We've come, we, we come to realize, if we haven't already, that there are times when we're going to be persecuted for righteousness' sake. Because, you see, we're on our way to heaven. And uh, uh, in all of this, verse 12 of chapter 5 says, we, we need to rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. And Jesus said, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So the stuff that we're going through is nothing new. And it's just nothing new. Sometimes we think we're the only ones that are going through stuff. And that's natural to think that way. A lot of times when we go through stuff, we're thinking, oh, I'm the only one going through this. See? But then as we get older, we come to realize, no, we're not. Others have gone before us. Read the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. Have you been sawed in two lately? Some of them folks were. Have you, died on, have you hung on a cross lately? Hmm. And then last week we talked about the fact that we are to be salt of the earth. And I want to read to you three verses. Matthew chapter 5. Verses 14, 15, and 16, and then we'll comment on it. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket. But they put it on a lampstand and it gives light to all who are in the house. So let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. In Isaiah chapter 42, Isaiah prophesies about the forthcoming wonders and character of Jesus. And then <clears throat> Isaiah 42, 6 says this, I will give, one of the things it says, I will give you as a light to the Gentiles, talking about Jesus. And then you fast forward Many, many years after Isaiah's prophecy, and a man named Simeon came into the temple in Jerusalem to see the baby Jesus. You're familiar with this story. It's, it's read every year, usually without fail, around Christmas time. And behold, this is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter <clears throat> 2. Verse 25, and behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. I want you to notice that, before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he, he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, get this picture. Here's this old man. God had spoken to him by his spirit. He said, Simeon, you're devout. 
you've looked forward, you know your Old Testament, you've looked forward to this one that the prophets have called the consolation or the comforter or the or the just the 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 overall ruler of the nation of Israel. You've looked forward to that. <clears throat> and it said he was led by the Spirit in the temple. And he comes in. And I thought about this the other night. As I'm holding little Noah Joe, I'm thinking, I wonder how Simeon felt in the temple when he picked up that baby and he was holding in his arms the baby Jesus. Wow. Wow. And I think Simeon may have said something like I've said time and time again about different events in our family down through the years. And I mentioned it the other night as I was sitting there. I, I, I can't help but feel that Simeon said, it doesn't get any better than this. It doesn't get any better than this. And he took him up in his arms and he blessed God, praised God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring a revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Now, regarding light, <clears throat> One of the purposes of Jesus was to be light to the nations. And what he has done for us as a church, those of us who know Christ, he has conferred upon us the same task to be light in this world. So Matthew 5, first part of verse 14, says, you are the light of the world. Hmm. Philippians 2.15 says this, that we are people, quote, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. And the world in that verse in Philippians, chapter 2, verse 15, and the word world here, you are the light of the world, refers to, to the world of human beings. It's the Greek word cosmos. And that particular word can include many things, many aspects of the world. But its usage here, and then also in that Philippians verse, has to do with human beings. We are to be, as it were, the light of the world, reflecting the light of Jesus into the world's darkness. Are you with me? Now, according to our context here in Matthew 5, there's a twofold influence of light as a light in the city and has a lamp in the house. I want to make an application. I looked at this passage oh, a lot of times down through the years and specifically over the last few months. And I want to share with you how God took this and applied it to my life. I just want to share that with you. And you know, it's nothing astounding. I want you to understand that it's not anything deep. Once you understand, it's very practical. And I want to take the city part and apply it to the church. And then I want to take the hill part and apply it to Calvary's hill, the hill on which stood the cross, on which Jesus died. So think about this. The church of Jesus Christ the body of Christ, those who are called out 
to serve him, those who are born again, those who are saved. The church must be set on the foundation of what took place on the cross. Paul said, for I determined among you to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. And the cross, you know why a lot of people, a lot of preachers don't want to talk about the cross? Because they'd be be accused of being foolish. People won't want to come to church. Because that's in tune with Paul said, for the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who do not believe. But to those of us who are saved, it's the power of God. The power of God. What do we got? I don't know how many people we got here this morning, but <clears throat> all of us are sinners. And committed a lot of sins down, down through the years in our life. Let's face it, we have. High five. We have. We just have. And you take that and, and, and multiply it. Of all the people who have been in the world since the world was created, Jesus comes into the world. He says, I'm going to die for your sin." I'm going to die for everyone's sin. Everybody in the entire world. You with me? God in the flesh. Jesus. And he said, I'm going to the cross. And it's no wonder when he realized the magnitude of that. That when he knelt in the garden, as recorded in John chapter 17, knelt in the garden of Gethsemane, he said, if it be possible, here's the human side of Jesus, if it would be possible, let this pass from me. But here's the obedience part. Yet not what I want, not my will, but yours be done. And he goes to the cross. There was power, power in what took place on Calvary's cross. See? Jesus said, remember this? Jesus said, I have the power to lay down my life. That took power to do that. He died for all the sins of the entire world for all the ages, and it took power to do that. Dunamis is the word, from which we get our English word dynamite. Kenny and I were talking about that here not all that long ago. The power that's in dynamite. Think about it. But it, that same dunamis, that power, Jesus said, I have the power to lay down my life and I have the power to take it up again. Power. Mm. And the church has to be set firmly on that foundation of what took place on that cross and needs to preach that. For the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who don't believe. It's just a bunch of poppycock. But to us who are saved, it's the power of God. I've seen it in my life. 
I see guys come into the program at the mission. Boy, do they experience the power of God. Guys who have all kinds of addictions and, and God delivers them. Does it take time? You bet it does. You bet it does. But they day in and day out, they experience power. A lot of times, it's the experience of that is not an overnight thing. Paul said in Philippians, I want to know him. And the thrust there is, I want to keep on knowing him and the power of his resurrection. I want to understand the power that can be mine through Christ. Notice this from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Therefore, since we have this ministry, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. We do not give up. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Paul simply given a testimony to the, to the light of Christ in his life. But even if our gospel is veiled or hid, it is hid to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. You look around you out here in Southern Humboldt, darkness in the hearts of people, in the hearts of people. And Jesus says to us, you're the light of the world. You're the light that can come to those people. They're in darkness. They need to understand the gospel, and the gospel is light. The scripture says the entrance of God's word gives light, gives light. Wow. You come to Christ like a light turns on. One of the guys at the mission said that this week. He says, I came to Jesus and, and, and it's like this light went on. This light went on in my heart, in my mind. For we do not preach ourselves or about ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves we're simply bondservants for Jesus' sakes. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. Talking about creation. Close your eyes real tight. Close them real tight. You can still see a little bit. But if you could just cut off all light, have total darkness, and all of a sudden, that's, I mean, that's the way it was at the beginning of this world. And the Bible says, God said, let there be light. Let there be light. I can't do that. I can't walk into a room. Some people say, I light up a room by just leaving it. I can't just walk in a room that's dark and say, oh, let there be light. But in this, in this world that was dark, the scripture says in darkness was over the face of the earth. And God said, let there be light. When we're blinded by the things of this world and we want to reach out to Jesus, Jesus comes along, taps us on the heart by the Holy Spirit and says, let there be light. We go, how'd you do that? How'd you do that? Remember the blind man? Jesus just touched his eye. He could see. And they questioned him. All kinds of stuff. What caused this and everything? 
blind man only knew one thing. What did he say? I don't know about all this other stuff, but I do know this. I was blind, but now I can see. See? About 9.30 at night, September 1st, 1962. Sitting in a room about this size. And when it came to knowing Christ, I was blind as a bat. But by 10 o'clock, I was saved. Boom. And it wasn't complicated. Sometimes I stop and think, now why didn't I do that before? But I remember, just as if it was yesterday, Lord, if I never do another thing in my life, I want to know when I leave this room tonight, I'm on my way to heaven. Come into my life and take over. God gathers the angels. Hey, there's this, there's this sailor sitting down in this room. He wants me to take over. Let's take over. And God took over. Pretty much been running things ever since. See, God came into my heart and said, let there be light. The church, this church, First Baptist Church, has been commissioned by God to the be, be the, the beacon of light to this part of the world of believe, unbelieving people. That's our job. That's our commission. Be light. Now, the other influence of light is to be light to all those in the house. Now, I, I want to apply this to like our immediate sphere of influence, which would start in our homes and then our places where we work, if we, if we still go to work. And above all, or at the same time, in just our close areas, our sphere of influence. You understand what I'm saying here? I'm making that clear. If we know Christ, he's lit our lamp. We're light. We're to be the light. Let me get back to Matthew here. It says... A city that is set on a hill can't be hidden or should not be hidden. That's the thrust here. People see it. It's there. People see this church. It's here. Sometimes when people give directions, they will use this building as a point of reference. Well, it's so far this way from the Baptist church. So far this way from the Baptist church. So we use this as a point of reference. So people are aware, a lot of folks here in Redway are aware that we have this building here. That's First Baptist Church of Redway. But we can't hide what we do inside here. You understand that? We're taught to go out and reach. Reach people in our sphere of influence. On our own, we cannot reach the whole city. That's the job of the corporate church. When I say corporate, I mean the whole church, working together, reaching people, see? Going into different areas, whether it's the prison, but it starts at our house. And sometimes when we see this, uh, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket. 
But on a lampstand, sometimes we think of just a little candle or a little uh, jar that holds a little lamp. But in, in those days, it was what, what they were talking about, it was kind of a lampstand. We have a, a light in our, our bedroom, it's just on a pole and got one of these lights that's about 500 watts or something like that. I mean, you turn that baby on, it lights up the entire room. You know, the room is all white, and it just lights up the entire room. And the lampstand in those days, that's kind of, it, it lit up the whole room, see? Lit up the whole room. And the thing is, nor do they light a lamp, and then put it under a basket, or put it under, one translation, I think King James says, put it under a bushel. But it's on a lampstand. It's there to, to give light to the whole room, to everybody in the house. See. My sister Kathy perished in a tragic accident back in January 1974. And Kathy came to know Jesus. Kathy was 12. And just about a year before that, she came to know Jesus in a Sunday school class that we out church. Her Sunday school teacher, Del Hawks, led her to the Lord. And Kathy went home. And she told her mom and dad that she'd accepted Jesus. And I remember because her dad, my stepdad, told me, said, I remember asking Kathy, so what are you going to do with that? At that point, Pop wasn't a Christian. Kathy says, I'm going to take Jesus to this whole family. 11 years old. I'm going to take Jesus to this whole family. My brother Chris, after he got out of the service, had a tragic accident, motorcycle accident. He was in the hospital in San Francisco. I'd come home. Kathy and I <clears throat> were driving in the family car down to see him. My folks were already down there. Kathy and I were driving down to see him. And so on the way down, Kathy says, I want to pray for my brother. So she knelt in that passenger seat of that 72 Monte Carlo, and she says, she prayed for her brother Chris. And then she goes, and God, I pray for my dad that he give his life to Jesus. A few months later, she was gone. My stepdad says, as he mourned, he was 62 years old, said, I wish there was something I could do for those kids. I said, let me tell you, we were in a, a house that was loaned to us because our the house my parents lived in had been destroyed by this big log jam 40 feet high that had come down and destroyed the house and killed my brother and sister. And I said, Kathy's desire was that her daddy would come to know Jesus. January 1974. My stepdad says, I'm going to do something about that. A month and a half later, he gave his heart to the Lord.
Kathy knew what it was to be a light in her part of the world. She knew what it was to erect in her heart that lampstand that lit up the house. My mom would share. Kathy would, would go to church, go to Sunday school and come home and, and mom said she'd just light up the whole place. Jesus had lit her lamp. And we can't take that, we can't take that light and hide it. And hide it. We gotta, we gotta shine. Mm. We gotta put it high on a lamp stand so the light of Jesus is on full display in our lives wherever we are. And then Jesus winds this short teaching on us being the light of the world by sharing it with us what he feels should be our motive for being the light of the world. Notice what he says in verse 16. So he says, let your light so shine before men that they may see, see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. People can see what we do. We are to illuminate the way of Jesus for others to see. So that by seeing what the light of Jesus accomplishes through us, they would glorify God. Years ago, a long time ago, in a church in Norfolk, Virginia, that I was part of, we had a servicemen center ministry there. We'd go down and invite guys to come out to church on Sunday morning down on the streets of Norfolk, Virginia. We had a couple buses, and one young man who, who got on the bus that morning didn't get on the bus that, that I was inviting people to get on. And when the pastor gave the invitation that morning, this young sailor comes forward. And I, I discovered later from the pastor, this young sailor was on my ship. And I was on a pretty good sized ship at that time, and I didn't know this guy. Didn't know him at all. Never seen him before. And the pastor shared with me that Sunday night, he said that young man that came forward, he said, uh, I asked him, young man, why are you here? And I was in the back of the room with the other folks, you know, and standing up and by the chair that I had been sitting in for church and everything, and, and I was back there, my head bowed and just praying. He said, this young man turned around and he, he said he pointed at you and he says, that sailor right there is on my ship and I want what he's got. <laughs> so something I did, he saw something in me that he wanted. And we talked about that a little bit last week in being salt is we want to be salt in such a way that we make people thirsty for righteousness. And the same thing with our light. We want to shine our light in such a way we don't want it to blind people. Sometimes we, we shine our light so offensively that it blinds people. Okay? But we need to just let it shine so it what? It shows the glory of God in our life. And people can see that. And they don't need to glorify us. They need to see us in such a way that they'll want what we have and they'll glorify God while they're doing it, while they're trying to get it. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works <clears throat> and glorify your Father in heaven. 
So, bottom line. Is this complicated? Not complicated. Is it deep stuff? No, it ain't. I can get deep, but I've chosen this morning not to. Because of the, just the way God has worked this particular passage in my heart at this particular time in my life. So, I want to be even more determined to reflect the light of Jesus into this world's darkness. My sphere of influence. And so, may we be able to say to the unsaved world out there, Hi, howdy, I'm a Christian, reflecting the light of Jesus, and I'm going to leave my light on for you. I'm going to leave my light on for you. Let's pray. Lord, uh, I just think that this is pretty easy to understand. You came into the world. John said you were the true light. John was simply a bearer of the light. But John said you, you, you were the true light that lights every person who comes into the world. And you've called us to be light to this world. And it would just really bless me today that those who, right here who've heard this would be even more determined to keep their lights on, to keep their light shining or people around them, people in their families, their friends, people in the community, some people that they may not even know. Who could see them and say, I want what he has, or I want what she has. And glorify God in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's what I want to do this morning as we close.